Yeah. Yes, Mikey. What do we, we got? We have one more award to play here. Then we're okay. going to bring on Joe. He's logging in right now. Good. And this next award is for the best win of the year. Steve, take it away. Best win. Win. What up, everybody, man? It's Earl of Pearl from the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show here to That's announce the nominees for the win of the year. Okay. First up is the Cleveland Browns versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in overtime. Oh, Second man. is Oscar Gonzalez and the Cleveland Guardians oh, with a walk-off yeah. win in the playoffs yeah. Yeah. versus the New York Yankees. Third, Donovan Mitchell's 71-point game. And the winner is SpongeBob and the Cleveland Guardians yeah, walk off win go. against the yep. New York Yankees. Yeah, yep. I thought it was the right. Rays. Yeah. Our, our fans are smart. All it was, right, because yeah, that's a play. I was game. worried was, that they picked I the was, Browns. I was too. I was very yeah. worried. But it was the Rays. Did he beat the Yankees too in a walk off? It was the uh, Rays home. Yeah, line. it was the Rays. I the thought ALCS it was game five of the Rays, the 17. I think it was. Well, he walked off. The better one was the Rays. The home run against the Rays. It was in 17 innings. Yeah, that's true because it ended the series. Yes, yeah. it was a series-ending walk-off yes. home run in right. the 17th inning. Yeah, but it's the like Yankees. We picked the wrong Os- Oscar Gonzalez home run. <laughs> the- game three against the Yankees. I don't but know. it was against the Yankees, against the Yankees. also. Against yeah, the Yankees. but we lost the series. Like, there's no question. That's true. The guys I got to go with these run. guys. I actually think I would put that second behind the I guess we should have looked at the vote before. Because <laughs> 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 they kept saying, like, look at the ballot. Look at the ballot. Vote, vote. I guess we should have done <laughs> yeah, that. I did send that to you guys. Did you have time to do it? I didn't. Well, we just looked at it, Mike. When I asked him a question, yeah, it's our good friend Joe Thomas. Joe joins us now. He was <laughs> our first guest on our third show ever. Joe, fast forward a year in the Hall of Famer. <laughs> What's up, back guys? Joining us now. What's up, Joe? Hall of Famer now. What's Soon up, guys? Well, we talked Thanks about this last time. I had Joe on my podcast recently, and we I asked him that question. Like, it's always weird now. Do you say Hall of Famer or soon to be? Because he's been he's been you know picked. He's Hall been of Fame elect. Yeah, right. What did you say, elect. Joe? What was your engaged. your answer? Was like you're engaged. Engaged. Right? engaged. <laughs> yeah, you're engaged to be in the Hall of Fame. You know? uh, right. We're don't not do quite that. married yet, but uh, we're heading down the aisle very shortly. Has you're picking it out the food. Yet? Uh, it has a little bit. I think probably the moment it sunk in the most was when I sent I spent eight hours with my sculptor last weekend uh, <laughs> in Salt Lake City on Saturday and uh, when you got eight hours with one man and you just sitting there and he's staring at you the entire time and breaking down every little wrinkle on your face uh, that's you crazy. have a chance to kind of let everything sink in and you Damn. see all the Hall of Fame busts that he's done that yeah. are up on the wall it's like wow this Can is I really ask- going to be real here pretty soon are you so this is something that I've been wondering about and I'm glad you brought the, the sculptor up like you don't look like Joe Thomas Hall of Fame left tackle anymore <laughs> Is he going with fat Joe Thomas? Is he going with like superhero looking Joe Thomas? Yeah, we're we're doing fat Joe. Uh, A little bit of a (laughs) blend. And my daughter heard me say that with my wife because Ben Hammond's the name of the sculptor. And he sent me uh, a video of where he is with the sculpture and he wanted some feedback. And my wife was like, well, this looks like you, but I don't know if it really looks like you because this kind of looks like in between fat Joe and skinny Joe. And my daughter says, (laughs) You can't say that. That's not a nice word. Like, oh, okay. Uh, football Joe and non-football Joe. Um, so we're kind of going with a little bit of a blend. But what I didn't realize is when I was sitting with Ben, we had like 11 years of pictures of me going back t- to my rookie year and when I was like totally bald with no yeah. beard and like a little pudgy. And then like five years later, I was like really pudgy with no hair on my face and a little bit of hair in my head and then right towards the end of my career i had shrunk down from like 325 at my peak to like 300 and i had a beard and a lot of uh power alleys receding hairline going on (laughs) over here so (laughs) there was a lot of different looks that i had during my career so we're trying to do a best of collection for the the, collaborative uh, you know you know joe you joe you shouldn't say engaged about the hall of fame because i've been engaged three times and never got married (laughs) so we want to make sure we want to well i did get married eventually but those three don't count four times the charm four times the charm promise you right Mm -hmm. so you know and there is a couple of times i did see you i always want Wonder. You always had the loosest pants I've ever seen for an oh. office line. You had the, you had the, <laughs> the you. cargo joints. Like I was like, how do I get my pants like that? I want the cargo <laughs> pants like Joe got. Them was crazy. Yeah. yeah, the guys at the Pro Bowl, they'd always try to tease me about my baggy pants, and I'm like, dude, why would you want 
tight pants that are restrictive. You ever right. seen a ninja right. with tight pants? No. A ninja is like the sneakiest little thing that has ever gotten around the earth. I want to be the sneakiest left tackle that's ever walked the breathe. football field. Ninja I want to lose pants so I can breathe, I can move. I you and nothing's let restricted. Me. Were, were your teammates like uh, Betonio, Mac, were those guys wearing inappropriately too tight pants? Everybody's wearing inappropriately yeah. too tight pants. <laughs> Not from a visual standpoint for me. I'm just thinking about like when I'm running, I'm <laughs> going down the field. I'm already pretty slow by the end of my career. So the last thing I want is to lose another tenth on my 40 because I'm wearing these super tight ball huggers. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Joe, 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 question for you. How many, uh, so how many other people from the University of Wisconsin are in the Hall of Fame? So that's a good question. There's two, I think. So Alan Amici uh, no from way back, like in the 50s. Uh, I don't think Crazy Legs is in the Hall of Fame. So I think it's Alan Amici and uh, Mike Webster, a great wow. center from Wisconsin, oh, then played wow. for the Steelers wow. for all those years. I know so there's two numbers. guys. Yeah, huh. it's not many. That's, like, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a heck of a feat, my friend. That's a heck of a feat. Pretty awesome. I mean, well, so I had no idea. I, I assume there was a lot more than that until yeah. I was actually announced and I did some of the radio shows in Madison and they said, yeah, you're the only the third Hall of Famer yeah. from Wisconsin of all time. And that wow. kind of blew me away. And obviously with J.J. Watt recently retiring, he'll be a first ballot guy. Russell Wilson getting towards the end of his career. I think he's got a great case for the Hall of Fame. So I think we're going to double those numbers pretty soon. But still, um, it was definitely a pinch me moment. And I've had a lot of those since I've been uh, officially even. named to be in this Hall of Fame class. That is amazing. Apparently, Crazy Legs is in and Amici's not, I'm being told. Oh, yeah, so I, I had it reversed. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. You, you could be right. I knew it was one of those great running backs from like the 40s and 50s. Yeah. So it was wow. Crazy Legs in and Amici not. Okay, great. That was a thousand years ago anyway. No, nobody's paying attention to the 1940s. Don't remember watching them play on <laughs> yeah. uh, my color television. The so final score was 8 7 every week. We're only a couple months away. <laughs> is the speech written? So we've got the first draft done. Now it's just all about workshopping because like, like you guys remember when you're writing a paper for school, the hardest yeah. is just putting it on paper, getting it down and then workshopping it and kind of tweaking things is that's the easy part. The good news is the, the Hall of Fame does a good job of kind of limiting the, the length. So guys aren't droning on and on. So you don't need to come up with 20 minutes of thrilling, epic content. You only need five or seven minutes, which that's no problem. Joe, here's the most important question. <laughs> Everything's on the line. You're going to lose every dollar you own unless you play one more football game. What? I, that's pretty harsh. I'm sorry. Uh, but, yeah, but ouch. Yeah, like you game. have to play one football, <laughs> one more football game. What position do you play? Could you play another position at this point? What would you do? Um, uh, I could play punter. I think uh, I could manage <laughs> a few boots down the field and kind of jog there, and hopefully nobody runs after me. How, um, how about tight like ends? Do you have decent hands? We don't know. Tight end. I've got no hands. Uh, I can still <laughs> block a little bit, and I feel like there's uh, there's enough medicine that could get me out there for a game. <laughs> um, but I do not know how I was going to feel for the next two weeks after that. Right, game. right. <laughs> now, that, that, now, here's a question. I, I've always I ask every lineman this, or I ask a lot of players who play, you know, different sports. What's something um, that you kind of hurt or happened during your playing career? What part of your body still hurts when you get up? <laughs> you only can pick one. Uh, it depends on the day. Uh, recently, you know, the weird thing is it's been my right hip. Um, I did the NFL draft pre show on Thursday and Friday, and then I flew to Salt Lake City and I sat for nine hours in a stool. So it was like, mm. you guys know when you do those, those, uh, Pre, pre game shows and stuff, you're basically yeah. sitting in a stool for the whole time. So, sitting in a stool, not good for the hips, not good for the back. So, three days in a row of that. And then I had to get home from my daughter's track meet because I'm coaching her fourth grade track team on Sunday. Nice. So, I had to take like the most outrageous red eye flights ever from Salt Lake City. It was Salt Lake City to Portland to Minneapolis to Madison. So, it was like four planes, and I slept like an hour in the airport, and I got back and I had a back spasm. I couldn't stand up oh, straight. I looked oh. like the letter C. And so recently <laughs> it's been the hip that's really not been feeling so great on me. And it, it's kind of lingered. And I, I know I've had some arthritis in there from being when you're a left tackle, you bend your right hip a lot more. And so you're in a little bit of a deeper bend. And I think you get more grinding there. Um, and I'm hoping it goes away soon because I don't want to have to go back under the knife to get that thing fixed. Yeah. Joe, how would you grade yourself 
as a track coach? Like, are you a, are you upper echelon? Oh. Are you just learning? <laughs> like, where are you in the rankings well, right now? Yeah. Well, I'm A plus if we would have had any meets thus far. Uh, however, as you guys know, yeah. in the Midwest, our weather can be a little bit unpredictable in the spring. So they've had three meets scheduled, and all three of them have been canceled due to weather. So this Thursday will hopefully be our first opportunity to get out on the track, and it'll be our last because it's the only one scheduled before the uh, the state meet. Oh. So if any of my shot put discus people qualify, uh, yeah. then I'll I'll feel a lot better about my A plus grade. What is your daughter doing? Like what what is her uh, sport there? Yeah, so she loves all sports, just like mom and dad. Yeah. Um, she's probably number one basketball because she's really tall and she's athletic yeah. and she runs well. Um, but she's loved track and it's great. She doesn't do the throws with me. I'm the shot and disc coach, so I help out gotcha. with some of the other kids. But I get to be around the team and, and I think awesome. that's fun. And that's kind of like that line you try to walk with your kids. Right. When you are coaching them, you don't want to be dad coaching. You just sure. want to be a coach. Um, and so it's actually been good that I'm not actually coaching her events, but I can still kind of be part of it. Um, and it's just fun watching those kids get out and have the same joy that you had when you were a kid. So you kind of yeah. relive in that uh, through their eyes. I want to hear more about the sculptor. What on earth are you doing for eight hours? If you're using, are you using pictures to sculpt this thing? Or are you like sitting there and <laughs> posing for him? No, he's actually like staring at you and posing. And you're posing for him. Um, it is a little bit interesting. I mean, the nice thing is you don't have to sit there still. You can get up and move around. But I think he said that it's a lot easier to do it from a live person than it is doing it off of pictures even for whatever reason. You know, when you're there in 3D and you're moving around and you, he's seeing how you move your face. I think that's the big thing. Like when you do different facial expressions, they want to see how the other parts of your body move uh, i mean i haven't done any portrait sculpting lately but if i was to i feel very well prepared after sitting with ben hammond for nine hours you're not like in a toga or anything are you no but it was interesting the last person he did i don't know if i can share this but he did calvin johnson and we all know megatron was like yoked like mr model and he, he said Hey, I asked Calvin it was okay if I did like a nude sculpting of him, and hopefully that wasn't taken the wrong way. <laughs> no, no, I think we all understand that it's not like a, a freaky thing, but like he has like, you know, the oh, Adonis was, body. It was exactly a freaky thing. What are you talking about? I certainly have loved to have uh, sculpted you know, back in the Greek times. Do they have I, just one sculptor do everyone, or is there a couple of them? There's actually three. So there's two main guys. Um, the guy that's doing mine, Ben Hammond. Um, and then there's another guy in Salt Lake City. And then those two guys do most of the current and players that are alive. And then there's a sculptor in Texas that does a couple people. He's kind of part-time and he does more of the deceased players. Um, okay. So that's kind of how they, they split it up. But these two, these two guys that do most of the sculptings um, the guy that did is doing mine, Ben, and then um, the other sculptor are like world renowned, some of the best portrait sculptors in the world. And you can see, I mean, you see other sculptures that come out of players. It doesn't always look like them. You know, remember the uh, was it the Ronaldo one that, that was oh, yeah, right. that kind of looked yeah, like some type yeah. of weird alien. Um, but these guys that have done the Hall of Fame bust, they nail it every single time, which mm. is no small feat. Hey, Joe, here's a question. We, we were having a debate earlier about the dog pound here in Cleveland. What are your thoughts? Yeah. The, what do you remember about the dog pound? So what I remember about the dog pound is just that loyal, passionate fan base in the end zone. They always had cool signs. They always were like the first ones there, the last ones to leave. Um, but it, I don't think it was ever as rowdy when I was there as the stories were about what the dog pound used to be in the you know the municipal right. stadium days in the in the 80s and 90s man maybe you guys have some fun memories that you'd love to share with me because i love hearing those old stories about like the guys bringing in the dog house that had the keg inside and you know four guys brought it in one guy brought it out that type of stuff uh, was... i'm sure you've heard about batteries being thrown at john elway right <laughs> yeah oh, yeah yeah i think they used to allowed them to be a lot more rowdy in the days they before cameras. It. Oh yes. yeah, they that was the Get Loud yeah. crew. Now, now for that stuff. They supplied the batteries. <laughs> <laughs> I think the rowdiest it's ever been is Bottlegate. I think. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah. famous. Crazy. Let's go to Mikey McNuggets. He has a question for Joe. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, Joe, you obviously played forever in the NFL, and that has to be like the highest of highs as far as adrenaline and excitement. 
now that you're doing so much media stuff, how, mm-hmm. how much do you enjoy doing the media side of things compared to playing? Is there anything in media and doing all your podcast videos that you actually enjoy more than you did playing? Mm-hmm. If that made any sense. Well, after I'm done with you guys, I'm going to stand up, walk to my coffee maker, pour myself a coffee. My knees are going to feel great. There's going to be no swelling in them. I'm not going to go run for the ice bags. There will be no ice baths. So, like, that's what I enjoy the most about the media, I think. Uh, You can feel like you're involved with the game of football, but then you walk away and you feel great. Uh, I think I really enjoy doing it because it gives me a reason to study the way I did when I was a player and to follow everybody in the NFL. Um, and you know, you get some of the same rush doing live TV as you did when you were a player, but obviously the pressure is different. You know, if I screw up on live TV, my boss might say something or people might laugh at me on Twitter, but if I screwed up with my job, like that quarterback's dead, like my running back's <laughs> just getting carried <laughs> off in a stretcher. Like the pressure's a little bit higher when you're playing. <laughs> Let, let's be honest, Joe. Half your quarterbacks were dead before you didn't even <laughs> block. Right. That's true. So they weren't really alive in the first place. Like let's true. be honest. If they have uh, made their performance like that's better, true. I would have let them get hit a few times. Oh. You know, you, Joe, how does it feel like having, like, there have been quarterbacks, you know, I think Johnny Manziel is one of them, and other quarterbacks have come back out and said, you know, I, you know, I, we didn't win as much as, as we, we could have. And, you know, I felt like I had an obligation to win for guys like Joe Thomas. What, like, what is that? Like, did, how, how does that feel for guys to say, man, like, we, we didn't get it done, but mention you specifically as a person who they thought, you know, could have got more. Like, I should have did more for, for guys like him. You would think that it would be like, oh, great. I'm glad they have that much respect for me. But then I think back and I'm like, well, wouldn't it have been great if you had that much respect for me when you had uh, <laughs> hey, you know, Don't tell me about it and, like, studied a little bit more? Like, <laughs> hey, that would have been great. Like, uh, it would be like your, your aunt being like, oh, you know what? I should have given you a better birthday present five years ago. But, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, you don't. I love you, but yeah, it's too late. Yeah. We, we love you. Should have done a better job. Sorry. Yeah. Joe, let me ask you one. Thanks. One, you talk about studying the game, and let's let's talk about Jedrick Wills because we talked about his fifth year option the other day, and obviously the Browns picked it up. It's a big year for him. He's had a lot of injuries the last couple of years. His play has been up and down. I brought up the point the other day. I think I, you may have even brought it up the, for the first time here that you know for him, there's the extra pressure of we're used to seeing you play left tackle. You s- set such a high bar that it was impossible. Jedrick Wills was never going to be Joe Thomas. So, But we have that. That's the one position for the Browns that we mm-hmm. have such a high standard that he can't possibly live up to. Not everybody can be Joe Thomas. Almost nobody can be. So he's got to be the best version of himself. What are you expecting for him from him this year? Well, uh, I mean, I've been expecting – consistent greatness from him for a while now because Mm -hmm. I've seen it uh, in stretches, like in practice, in games. He's had very nice stretches, and then it's that inconsistency. I think it's that lack of consistent focus that has really hurt his career more than anything because there's been really good stretches of play, but especially in the era of social media, like all it takes is you screwing up three or four times or looking lost on the field three or four times in a game, and people put it together in a cut-up. And then that becomes the narrative of how you've been playing or even your career, uh, fair or unfair. And so I think for him, I I really hope that seeing that he's really in a turning point in his career, knowing that, hey, they just picked up my fifth year option, but they kind of pushed it down and delayed it a little while before they did it to kind of send a little bit of a message. And he's got to know that if he plays well this year and he shows that he can have that consistent focus, that we hope that he can because he's got the talent, he's got the technique, he's got everything you need. Just put it together f- uh, for long stretches of play. You could be one of the highest paid offensive linemen in the NFL. But if you don't, like you may be doing this somewhere else next year or, or the following year. So um, I expect that this is going to be his breakout season uh, because I, I think that that can be really motivating for guys when they realize that, oh, wow. I don't have four or five years left on my contract. Like, this is it. Like, yeah, it's right. make or break time now. This is how I'm going to be remembered going into free agency, whether it be here or somewhere else. And then all of a sudden they figure it out and it and all clicks. And 
he's not that far off. Like, like I said, it's just having that consistent focus, understanding that every play is really important. Like I mentioned earlier, like the dudes behind you, they're counting on you and you can't have one playoff. Is really quickly, uh, w have you got a chance to watch uh, Dewan Jones? I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on the kid from Ohio State. Massive Actually, two offensive linemen. Yeah, State two draft, right. Yeah. Massive, massive yeah, guy wow. um, out there. What have you initially uh, saw from him, and your thoughts on him at, from your expert opinion? Well, I was really excited when we got him. I mean, to be able to get a guy that's three seventy, six eight, six nine, that can move like a basketball player, like he moves. Um, those guys are hard to find. They're not your everyday offensive lineman. I mean, I can think of a couple guys in the history of the game that have looked like that. Jonathan Ogden being one of them. Makai Becton, a top five pick from a few years ago who's battled some injuries. Um, but I, I think, especially where they got him in the draft, talk about a uh, high reward potential with a low risk. Because look, you're looking at those stats right now, 41 games. So he's got some experience. Now he's a little bit rough technically, but that's what Bill Callahan is for. Because when you watch him, when you watch him run, when you watch him move laterally, vertically, like he's got all the skills that you need. It's, it's just a mound of clay right now. And it'll be up to those coaches to be able to kind of form that into a great offensive lineman, a great offensive tackle. And uh, if he's got the desire, I, I believe that he can be a great offensive lineman because he's got that skill set um, and he can move, he can get off the ball, which to me, the biggest question mark I always have with big guys like that at offensive tackle is, can you get off the ball on your pass set in your first kick quickly? Because that's where those guys get beat. You see Miles Garrett blowing past those guys on their first kick and then they're out of balance and they're trying to catch up. And, and you, if you're playing catch up in your pass set, you'll never get there and you'll always be at a disadvantage. And that defensive lineman is going to do whatever he wants to you in that case. So a man that's as quick as he is can get his body, his 370 pounds from zero to 60, essentially as fast as a Maserati. He's got mm. what it takes. Like yeah. that is the biggest question. And he's got that now. Can he refine his technique? Can he be consistent? Those are the question marks that I have, but it'll be fun to watch. Joe, we know he would probably make a good uh, sumo wrestler. So my question for you is, of every teammate you ever played with, offensive lineman and defensive lineman, I'll leave you out of it so you don't have to put yourself. Every mm. one of your teammates <clears throat> were, were putting together in their primes mm. a sumo wrestling tournament. <laughs> Who are you laying your money on? <laughs> I like that. So, uh, Sean Rogers, first of all, would be undefeated. Oh. There's no way that anybody would be able to beat him in a sumo contest because he had a clause in his contract to get under 360 when he played with me. And he was not <laughs> usually under 360. He was like 375. But he was as nimble as a point guard. He could dunk a 16-pound shot put. He was, oh, wow. you know, a 32, 33-inch vertical at that weight. And when he was ready to go and when he wanted to turn it on, he was literally unblockable. I mean, he made Alex Mack look like an undrafted free agent when oh, wow. they were going against Jeez. each other. And he made Alex Mack look like he was 220 pounds. And Alex was 320, just the way he would throw him around uh, because Sean was just so big and so powerful. So he'd be my first choice. Ted Washington would be my second choice. Ooh. He was over 400 pounds. Ooh. Didn't move quite as well as Sean Rogers. Um, but you can go back and see old film of him. He yeah. was incredible, and he had the body of a sumo wrestler. No, no offense, Ted Washington, if you're listening back home, wherever you are right now. Um, so those those would be my first two picks. Okay, and then I would say Alex Mack. He was a you know big time heavyweight wrestler. Right at uh, in California growing up, so he would probably be the, that next tier of of guys. That's a good top three. All right, let's go to Mikey McNuggets. We got an award to give out, right? Mikey? We do. Joe, Ooh. as you heard as we came into this interview, we're giving out our <laughs> My first year is here. <laughs> of the History of the Show Awards, and we are now joined by the one and only Mike Polk Jr. to hand out our next award. <laughs> Joe, we want you to be He's on this for, uh, for, the, for the award ceremony. Polk, take it away. Gentlemen. Good, good to see you, Mr. Mike. Thomas. Always good to see you. I'm excited to be here. Well. Congratulations, everyone, on a year of success here at UCSS. Woo! Couldn't be more thrilled for everyone. Joe, congrats on your thing, too. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am here to present the award for the best interview of the year. Pretty big deal. I mean, it we're is. Talking about mm -hmm. some high rollers we've had on here over time. You know, Bernie Kozar, 
You had the, the, the female Browns fan lady. That was good. You had, as I recall, uh, Smoking Joe Charbonneau was on. That went well. So we have a lot to pick from. So this is a hot category. And somebody who's on right now might be mentioning it. Shh, we'll find out. Okay, let's see. The best interview of the world. Was it? Do we have, we don't, there's no drum roll. Not, we don't have that in the budget. No, Maybe no drum roll. Okay. <laughs> was it A, Joe Thomas ranks his favorite cheeses? Let's take a look. That was a great segment. Ooh. Now you're known as Skinny Joe Thomas, okay? It's that's absurd. That's kind of what we call you. Uh, the bull says that he doesn't like Skinny Joe Thomas. He likes Ooh. heavier, stockier Joe Thomas. Like, what do you What do you make of that, Joe? That was like that was the one thing I could say. Like you're this great athlete. You're a great guy. It's like at least he's not that you were fat, but you were just big. I'm like, hey, at least <laughs> I'm like Joe. We're both 300 pounds. Now you're skinny as a rail. I don't even have that. No, I mean, come no, on. I got nothing. So I, I'm so sorry. I, I hope that I'm never going to go back to Fat Joe. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> knees are Joe's much skinny, happier. Not <laughs> skinnier. Not skinny, but not as yeah. Fat Joe. <laughs> that was a great segment. It was a good segment. And uh, I do like that you come. He, uh, Adam just said, I've come to terms with the fact yeah, that I, I, Joe I'm is happy. Now. I'm happy for Joe he's and his family that he's in. That's that he's good. Skinny Joe. Now. All right. <laughs> B, let's, let's find out who's our next one. It's B. Brian Hartline considers changing his recruiting hashtags. Take a look. Oh, I How about just hashtag D's? <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> what are you doing oh, here? That's great. That He's was... laughing. That means it's working. <laughs> All right, two more, coach. Inappropriate. Let's take Inappropriate. the next one, Steve. How about hashtag <laughs> Buck Naked? <laughs> How come we don't do these hashtags my anymore? Least this was <laughs> That was well done. That, that was, was a good awesome. One too. I love that one of Mikey's nominees for best interview is just him talking for <laughs> 45 <laughs> seconds. The guy, hey, Heartland didn't fans, get worded. Fans nomination. Fan fan nomination. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Allegedly, fans. allegedly. Sure, the fans. Okay. <laughs> and then finally, C, Maurice Claret's Life's Trials and Tribulations. Oh, yeah. That interview is 90 minutes, so we cannot pick a 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. Right. right. Okay. And the winner. Are we going to find out the winner? Do I know the winner? I don't say it. You say it, right, Mikey? You have the winner. Do I? <laughs> if not, I will announce it. But yeah, you go have ahead. The winner. And the winner is. I'm at, Go ahead. <laughs> say it. <laughs> Mikey, say it. It is Joe Thomas. It's Joe Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been quite awkward had it not been Joe. I think that right, was like, the case. Yeah. Ryan Hartline, congratulations. How much more awkward would have been if I would have been wrong and then we would have given the award and then rescinded it yes. like it was Twilight. And and what is Joe getting these. for winning this? Is he getting a, like a great gift or something? Some cheese. <laughs> yes, we're going to get him some, cheese uh, some, cheese. some more shirts. And when we get the sweatshirts, that the quote little YouTube show sweatshirts, we'll send one up to Wisconsin for Joe. Joe, thanks so oh. much, as always, for joining us. We really appreciate Congrats, it. Congrats, Joe. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you, Joe. Oh, wow. It's always a pleasure. Always the highlight of my week. <laughs> thanks for having yeah. me on.